It's a great pleasure to be here just immediately post book. Um, I pushed myself not just to give a bit of synopsis of what I've done so far, but also to open up some of my new research questions, which we, perhaps we can discuss a bit more in the conversation. So I'd like to begin with Margaret Goodman, who was a volunteer nurse working alongside Florence Nightingale during the Crimean War of 1854 to 56. And Margaret Goodman describes the types of yarn which were popular with her soldier patients. Deeds of cruelty or wickedness were never boasted of, while not only acts of courage but acts of mercy were applauded, such as when, on the taking of Sebastopol, a man at the risk of his life rescued a Russian child from the bayonet of an intoxicated Frenchman, and restoring the boy to his mother, guided them both to a spot which appeared less exposed. Or when a wounded soldier lying on the field of Alma shared that inestimably precious treasure under such circumstances, the water in his calabash, with one of the enemy near, whose sufferings appeared more intense than his own. In their sentimental climax in the self-sacrificing relief of others' suffering, regardless of their side in the conflict, these tales share a widespread narratological commitment to heroic presentations of the military man of feeling. This kind of narrative swerve is a popular one in the mid-Victorian period, visible in art and literature and in work produced by soldiers themselves. The restoration of vulnerable children and relief of the wounded are typical plots. Today, I want to distill some answers to the central question I asked in my recent book. Why does mid-Victorian British war writing, by soldiers and professional writers and artists alike, eschew violence in favour of acts of mercy? And I want to raise some new questions about what happens to the military man of feeling at the height of Britain's imperial expansion in the late 19th century. So plots of soldiers adopting children on the battlefield and nursing wounded comrades recur. Um, these include work by Charles Dickens, Charles Kingsley, Charlotte Young, Dinah Crake and William Makepeace Thackeray. In Thackeray's novel The Newcombs, which was published during the Crimean War, he stars an eminently gentle soldier, Colonel Newcombe. Colonel Newcomb offers a neat example of the kind of reparative narrative favoured by Goodman's patients. Asked by a young nephew and niece about how many people he's killed in combat, he turns attention instead to a more ameliorative aspect of conflict, the heroism of an army surgeon who, when fever broke out on a transport ship, devoted himself to the safety of the crew and died. He continues one of the novel's only descriptions of military action with a PM to non-violence, self-sacrificing courage. What heroism the doctors showed during the cholera in India and what courage he had seen some of them exhibit in action, attending the wounded men under the hottest fire and exposing themselves as readily as the bravest troops. As in many other examples, the most commended form of courage is that of saving rather than of taking life. In Vanity Fair, Thackeray also recommends the nurturing soldier as a preferred military subject. He introduces the year 1815 like this. When the soldier who drank at the village inn not only drank but paid his score, and Donald the Highlander, billeted in the Flemish farmhouse, rocked the baby's cradle while Jean and Jeanette were out getting the hay. As our painters are bent on military subjects just now, I throw this out as a good subject for the pencil to illustrate the principle of an honest English war. Thackeray positions this vision of the caring domesticated soldier as preferable to the heroic death and glory representations in some vogue at the time. Writing in Punch under the pseudonym of Professor Biles, Thackeray expresses revulsion in response to the military pictures exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1847, particularly this, The Battle of Miani by Edward Armitage. As Professor Biles says of the painting, in this extraordinary piece, they are stabbing, kicking, cutting, slashing and poking each other about all over the picture. A horrid sight. I like to see the British lion mild and good-humoured, 
not fierce, as Mr Armitage has shown him. Reframing what I think is um, a typically Thackerayan double-edged critique in Vanity Fair, Thackeray proposes the image of the warrior rocking the cradle as a more appropriate subject for military art, which can, quote, illustrate the principle of an honest English war. Thackeray's tone here is typically difficult to identify. That propagandistic formula, honest English war, raises questions about the honesty of displacing soldiers stabbing and poking with cradle rocking. At the same time, as is evident in characters like Colonel Newcomb and Dobbin, the gentle hero of Vanity Fair, Thackeray was himself drawn to gentle forms of war heroism and to depictions of war that emphasised emotional losses and quiet victories of feeling and conscience over battle action. The cutting, slashing school of military representation, exemplified by work, by work like that by Armitage and gung-ho writers like G.A. Lawrence, was marginalised by the cultural predominance of gentle representations of the soldier. The domesticated British lion, mild and good-humoured, was as the sardonic inference behind the bluster of Professor Biles suggests, the much more likeable face of the British war machine. The mid-Victorian reframing of military masculinity as gentle, nurturing and life-saving calls for a reassessment of assumptions about Victorian masculinity. And I'm participating in wider recent work that is belatedly recognising the cultural investment in men's emotional literacy in this period. And one of the shifts in Victorian studies, I'd say, over the last 10 to 15 years has been this wealth of attention to masculinity, particularly domesticated masculinity. The Victorian gentle soldier also resonates with the propagandistic work performed by more recent representations of kind-hearted gunmen. My use of this phrase echoes that of Joanna Bork and Ian Brownlee, who critique the late 20th and 21st century casting of war as humanitarian intervention through a domesticated version of military masculinity. And I've been very inspired by Derek Gregory's work. Um, this is a collage of his titled The Reenchantment of War. He uses US Department of Defense photographs um, to overlay these images of soldiers in battles for hearts and minds with which we've become so familiar in the media onto photographs of targeted streets and ruined homes. And I've been wondering how far images like this, which is um, a favourite of mine, Dickens's Corporal Theophile from his 1862 Christmas number, Somebody's Luggage, raising the little child Babelle who he's found in need of loving and has adopted her. Um, how far that kind of image might anticipate something like this, or how far um, some of the first photographs of returning soldiers, this is Sergeant Dawson, returning from the Crimea having lost an arm to be reunited with his slightly perturbed young daughter, um, whether they might anticipate things like this. And um, thanks to my students who directed me to the YouTube phenomena of the soldier surprise return video, um, which is particularly endemic in the US, also very popular in the UK. And I thought I might just share with you one particularly extreme, I think, version of this. Um, this is the Poppy Girls performing at the Royal British Legion Festival of Remembrance with a royal audience um, in 2013. Um, at the 9th of May, you can see when I checked, um, this video had almost half a million views. Let me just explain that one of our poppy girls has a father currently deployed on operations in the Indian Ocean. Lieutenant Commander Billy Adams 
isn't due back for another three months, so unfortunately, he wouldn't have been in a position to see his daughter perform tonight. Well, Megan, we have a very, very nice surprise for you right now. For an extended version, please consult YouTube. <laughs> so Victorian gentle soldiers embody a range of humanitarian values compatible with the new liberal rhetoric of war. As Jonathan Parry puts it in his exploration of the development of a constitutional and humanitarian rhetoric of defence in the second half of the 19th century, in the Crimean conflict, the attempt to infuse liberal politics with ethical righteousness had won its first victory, a war that was to kill over half a million people. Given the prevailing view of Britain's role as the defender of liberty, progress, fairness and self-government against brute aggression, representations of the ideal soldier as an antidote rather than incitement to that brute aggression supported the coherence of the liberal rationale for war. The continuing popularity of the gentle soldier goes against the powerful mythology of the stiffening of the upper lip in the late 19th century. Given the cultural work performed by the kind-hearted gunman in suggesting that military men might be a civilising force, it's perhaps little surprise that these figures retain their popularity through this period of imperial expansion. Robert Baden Powell distills the imperial ideology of advancement in Scouting for Boys of 1908. There he scripts out Pocahontas, a, a typical move in his um, preparation of exciting materials for the scouts. Um, he gives a play script so that they can recreate the capture of Captain John Smith and his conversation with Pocahontas's father, the king. Smith says to the king, what brought me here was duty to my king and God and countrymen to spread his powerful sway over all the earth that you and yours may know of God, that trade may spread to carry peace and wealth throughout the world. Our mission is to clean the world. The threats that follow tend to undermine the assertion Smith voices, we men are born not for ourselves but to help others. While in the Pocahontas play, the violence of imperial ideology surfaces, more typically the handbook's concern with preparedness for potential invasion of Britain and the work of empire, is partly camouflaged by the emphasis on life-saving. The fifth instalment, for example, is composed of a chapter on saving life, coping with, quote, panic, fire, drowning, runaway horse, mad dog and miscellaneous, Followed by, <laughs> I love Baden Powell. Followed by a chapter on patriotism focused on our empire, how it grew, how it must be held. This structure works, I think, to erase the violence of imperial history, overwriting it with a humanitarian concern with saving imperiled lives. A variation of the swerve made by Thackeray's Colonel Newcomb from telling killing to an account of lives preserved. The soldier adoption plot features a similarly preserving, life-preserving, nurturing masculinity. This plot continued into the later century in work like Boothwell's Baby, a story of the Scarlet Lancers. This 1885 novella, written by Henrietta Eliza Vaughan Stannard under the pseudonym John Strange Winter, sold over 2,000 copies, was developed through a number of sequels, adapted for the stage, and later made into a film. Just a quick blast from Bootle's baby, Miss Mignon is the little child who he has adopted. Miss Mignon's favourite plaything was Bootle's himself, after Bootle's Lucy, his best officer friend. People said it was wonderful, the depth of affection between the big soldier of 35 and the little dot of a child scarcely two. Bootles she adored, and where Bootles was she would be, if by hook or by crook she could convey her small person into his presence. The account of this big soldier's depth of affection 
is rather different to the forms of military manliness predominantly associated with the expansion of the British Empire and with the genre of boys' own fiction most closely identified with it. Michael Roper summarises the prevailing view. The muscular Christianity of the mid-19th century, which had emphasised such qualities as compassion, fairness and altruism, had given way to secular and more aggressive ideals. Particular value was placed on stoic endurance, that is, the forbearance of pain and the suppression of sentiment. The persistence of tropes of the military man of feeling, so popular in the mid-century, complicates this. Thackeray's Colonel Newcombe, for example, retained his status as the preeminent gentleman of English fiction, a view expressed in emotionally intense reactions to Michael Morton's 1906 stage adaptation of Thackeray's novel. The Daily Mail highlighted the difficulty of representing a truly lovable man, asking, how shall it be possible to put upon the stage that most tender and pathetic character in the whole of modern English literature, Colonel Newcombe? The play achieved its greatest success a decade later with a revival in the First World War. Herbert Beerbohm Tree returned to the role of Colonel Newcomb, touring Canada and the United States with the play in the winter of 1916-17. The New York Times echoed reviews of a decade earlier praising Sir Herbert's portrait of the Colonel, a performance that is genuinely charming and alive with a heartiness that is admirable. Tree went on to appear in the role on a night in aid of mutilated soldiers at the Metropolitan Opera House. These continuities in enthusiasm for the military man of feeling complicate the standard emotional history of increasingly stoical masculinity that would, so the argument goes, only be shattered by the First World War. They do not, however, suggest that the period was less bellicose than we have thought. Indeed, by overlooking the rhetorical force of the kind-hearted gunman in this period, we may have even underestimated the militarism which this figure worked to ameliorate. My hunch, however, is that an emotional history of military masculinity in the late 19th century will yield more mixed findings of competing... <laughs> and I'd love to talk a bit more about that mixture of Baden-Powell within Baden-Powell, but that would have to be on another day. Um, him writing to his mother from the Siege of Mafeking about her choice of curtain fabrics mm -hmm. and discussing how he had found the most perfect damask hue for her. Um, Marvellous kind of contradictions in his um, stoical imperial persona. Um, and even the fact that at Matha King he performed um, Sidney Carton's dying speech from Tale of Two Cities in order to put heart into the men. So I think there's, there's another story to be told about these um, imperial stiff upper lipped heroes. For now, I'll hypothesise that the suppression of sentiment has been an overstated component of later imperial masculinity. Just as the mid-19th century soldier performs competing cultural work, radically expanding our understandings of Victorian masculinity, while troublingly, troublingly endorsing the value of war, my initial explorations of the later period suggest similar tensions, mixed feelings and mixed politics. So I'm now working towards a new set of research questions. How far do rhetorics of military domesticity and sentimentality enable or disable imperial violence? Certainly, the kind-hearted gunman as sentimental hero has a long and continuing emotional history. Switch to this search of YouTube for soldier return videos. Today there are over 4 million YouTube views for one of, 2016, one of several 2016 compilations of soldier surprise return clips. And um, you can see through a pattern through these of the mandated, or at least the acceptable, response of liking the videos. This endorsement encompasses both refreshing validation, perhaps, of emotionally sensitive military manliness 
and a more disturbing refashioning of military masculinity to frame war as humanitarian endeavour.